algorithms. Uh, last time I motivated the uh, quantum circuit model and argued that it's uh, just thinking about quantum circuits should be enough to talk about quantum algorithms in principle and introduced some various building blocks to make quantum algorithms out of. So now we have kind of a degree of a higher level language for describing uh, quantum algorithms rather than just decomposing everything straight from bare gates. And so today I'll continue to uh, expand this uh, list of tools and then we'll apply them to do some interesting things culminating with Shor's algorithm. So the first thing I'd like to uh, talk about are oracles. And we've already sort of been casually using them in the previous lecture, but this time we'll look at them a little bit more systematically and generally. <coughs> So uh, oracles are basically much like a subroutine in um, classical algorithms. And there are interesting things you can use subroutines for besides cleaning up your code. And one of those is recursion. And similar ideas uh, are applicable in the quantum case, but there are some new uh, issues that you have to be aware of which are not familiar from the classical case. So last time we saw an example of an oracle we said that if f is some efficiently computable function that we can compute with a classical circuit, then we can always correspondingly construct a quantum subroutine from reversible gates that will evaluate this function and add it into some up register using some ancilla qubits as workspace. So this was an oracle that we've already used. But more generally, an oracle could be any unitary, uh, a quantum oracle could be a unitary acting on some number of qubits that you then apply either uh, conditionally or just unconditionally. So uh, <clears throat> one thing you could do with access to a unitary oracle is something called the Hadamard test. So in this case, the, the task you're trying to do is you're trying to estimate some matrix element of this unitary that you know how to implement. And what, here's a statement of what the Hadamard test allows you to do. Um, basically what this statement is telling you is that if you can construct this state psi efficiently by some quantum circuit and this state lambda, uh, phi and you can implement u efficiently, then you can estimate this uh, matrix element, its real and imaginary parts, both to uh, plus or minus epsilon precision in time which scales as the sum of the costs of making this, making this, implementing this, and that divided by epsilon squared. So in the next couple of slides, I'll just show how to do that. So the first observation is that it actually suffices just, you can reduce this problem to estimating diagonal matrix elements. Because if you have some circuit u psi that makes psi, and you have some circuit u phi that makes phi, you can just take this and rewrite it like this. So now you're estimating a diagonal matrix element of u conjugated on, well, multiplied on one side by u phi and by u psi on the other side. So very simple. So we just need to be able to estimate diagonal matrix elements and even if we could just fix it to the all zero state. So, okay, here's an easy exercise just to get you warmed back up. Suppose we have a circuit for u. How do we make a circuit for u inverse? Well, you can probably see you just invert the gates one by one and put them in reverse order. That's the inverse circuit. Okay, yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. So this is just to make sure you're awake. Okay. So here's the Hadamard test. This is the circuit for it. And so let's just work through and see what this circuit does. So we start with this product state. Now, if this control uh, qubit is in the one state, only in that case is u applied. So we have u psi and one, uh, zero psi and one u psi. Now we do a Hadamard gate on the first qubit. So that changes 0 to 0 plus 1 and changes 1 to 0 minus 1. Now we can collect terms to write down what we have corresponding to 0 and what we have corresponding to 1. So that's this expression. And so what we have multiplying 0 is this state. So when we measure now, the probability of getting 0 is going to be the, the norm of, of this piece. And 
So if we look at the norm of this piece, that's the inner product of this piece with itself. So we expand this term by term. We have psi psi, that's one. Uh, psi u dagger u psi from uh, this and this piece, that's one. And then here, this is uh, the matrix element we're looking for. And this is just uh, the complex conjugate of that matrix element. So now this is two plus twice the real part of the matrix element we want. And so this is proportional to the real part of what we're looking for. And so if we sample uh, from this probability distribution, count what fraction of times we get zero, that gives us an estimate of this real part. And of course, if we sample n times, our error is going down like this one over the square root of n. And similarly, to get the imaginary part, you just put this initial state in there instead of this one, and you work through the analogous calculation, which I won't go through, and you just get the imaginary part. So that's the Hadamard test, which turns out to be a very handy tool. So there's the result stated again. There's our circuit for it. Remember, we can reduce the problem of estimating with the all zero state if we just take u, u phi dagger, and u psi like that. And that gives you an arbitrary uh, matrix element between phi and psi. So one interesting application of this, which I'll just mention now to whet your appetite for uh, my third lecture, is that the uh, quantum algorithms for estimating Jones polynomials uh, ultimately boil down to doing a Hadamard test. Uh, so the w a way to think about it is that um, a uh, Jones polynomial can be viewed as a certain kind of transit transition amplitude in a topological physical theory. And you're, when you cap off the ends of the braid, you're doing something analogous to taking a matrix element between vacuum states. These are like pair creations and annihilations. So anyway, we'll talk a lot about that uh, on the third lecture. And it's just an example of how uh, you can get quantum algorithms by thinking about simulating other physical systems and using Hadamard tests, which are two of the things that we've been uh, emphasizing. OK, but now let's look at one of the earliest uh, quantum algorithms. It's a nice, simple example. And it illustrates some of the uh, principles we've been using. And it's historically important. So suppose you have uh, an oracle that takes one bit of input and produces one bit of output. And all you're trying to do is decide whether uh, f of 0 equals f of 1. So people sometimes phrase this as, you have a coin, you want to decide whether it's a fair coin or if it's a two-headed type of coin. Two tails also, you don't care about distinguishing that from two heads. So classically, obviously, you'd have to just query f of 0 and f of 1. So you need two queries to solve this problem. And quantum mechanically, you only need one query to this oracle in order to solve this problem. And here's the entire algorithm. So what you can see is you start with this initial state. You apply your oracle f which adds f of x mod 2 into this bottom register. So as we've seen many times before, this kicks back a phase minus 1 to the f power. So if we have 0 as the input, we have minus 1 to the f of 0. If we have 1 as the input, we have minus 1 to the f of 1. And we can see that uh, if we next do a Hadamard transform, what we're going to get is this state, so the amplitude uh, on the zero state um, will be uh, of magnitude 1 if these are equal, because these things will not cancel out. And it will be magnitude 0 if they're unequal. So with a single query, we can tell whether this is a two-headed coin without having to look at both sides. So one thing. Uh, that might immediately pop into your mind is, well, why don't we try using this algorithm recursively? So this is uh, computing the parity of a pair of bits, producing its output as a bit. So what if you took Deutsch algorithms and you chained them together into a tree? What would happen if you tried this? Would you then be able to determine the parity of n bits with a single query? 
And the answer is that this fails to work, and it fails to work for a kind of instructive and interesting reason, which is really not familiar from the classical setting. Uh, so the point is that you can take quantum algorithms and use them as subroutines in other quantum algorithms, but they need to be clean algorithms in the sense that they erase their garbage bits and they don't leave input-dependent global phases. So normally, uh, in quantum mechanics, a global phase is something unobservable. You don't care what the overall phase is in front of your wave function. But now, if you're running your oracle conditionally on some, other, uh, on some superposition of inputs, then these global phases become relative phases. Uh, so here, if you look at Deutsch's algorithm again, what you find is the output state has the answer written in your output register, but it also has a global phase of minus 1 to the f of 0. So that just comes from looking at this formula, which was the final state uh, of our Deutsch algorithm circuit. So here you see, uh, for example, uh, if f of 0 and f of 1 uh, both equal 0, then you'll have a plus sign. If they both equal 1, you'll have a minus sign. Um, so now, if we try to recurse, this is going to create problems for us. And in fact, it will exactly destroy the interference uh, that we're trying to use in a, a Deutsch algorithm. <coughs> so working through that statement, here you have some input. Here's our uh, <coughs> Deutsch algorithm subroutine. What you get out is uh, this with this global phase, minus 1 to the g of x. So this phase gets added to the phase that you really care about. And so when you're acting on the on this product of these two phases, then your result will be complete garbage, because you'll be getting f of x plus g of x instead of just f of x, which is what you really want. So you have to be a little bit careful uh, using quantum algorithms recursively. So you can always fix this problem at a cost of doubling the, the expense of your, your oracle. If you start with some uh, dirty oracle, which produces some garbage qubits in an output register and some input-dependent global phase, what you could always do is you could run this oracle, you could copy the output, and you could run the inverse oracle. If this oracle is, in some sense, classical-like, so that the output is unentangled with the other stuff, then this will uncompute all the garbage, including the phase. But the cost of this is that now uh, you, it takes twice as much work to do what you did before. And in the case of the uh, uh, deutsch josa algorithm, that exactly undoes your advantage. So you can't use deutsch josa recursively to solve the parity problem faster than classically. And in fact, it's now known uh, that you can't get a very large speed up over classical computing at all with quantum algorithms. So there's a lower bound, which for, is for total function. Uh, for parity, I'm specifically. No, for parity, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. And also there's a result like this for total functions as well, which is yeah, says you can only get um, polynomial speed ups, but yeah, yeah, fine, sorry. yeah. So here it was uh, proven almost simultaneously by these two groups, and they showed a lower bound of n over two queries quantumly for this problem. And one thing you'll notice here, I've started talking about lower bounds, which is something I didn't talk about at all um, yesterday. And the reason for that is that yesterday we were talking about circuit complexity. How many gates do we need to solve a given computational problem? And it's incredibly difficult to prove lower bounds for that, classically and quantumly. Here, our measure of, we've, I've sort of sneakily drifted into using a different measure of complexity here which is how many queries do you need to make to your oracle? And in this case, in many, it, there are many instances where you can prove uh, lower bounds. And that's because you can think about the problem information theoretically. If you don't make enough queries to this oracle, you simply don't have enough information to solve the problem. And that's a much easier thing to analyze than can we make this efficient, some unitary efficiently out of, um, uh, out of gates. OK, 
So that's uh, some, so the Hadamard test and the uh, Deutsch algorithm are two things that we can do that are kind of interesting with a single Hadamard gate. So now let's see some interesting things we can do uh, using lots of Hadamard gates. So suppose we just have some arbitrary input state, sum over the bit strings x, amplitudes a of x, ket x, and we apply a Hadamard gate to each of these input gates, each of these bits. So we'll end up with some new superposition. I've called the new amplitudes a tilde of k. And by a short calculation, you can see that a tilde of k is going to be given by this formula. So some linear combination of these a of x's. Here, this is minus 1 to the k dot x. And by dot, what we mean is the bitwise modulo 2 dot product of these bit strings. So just uh, an example. You know, maybe you have 1, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 0, 0, 1. So the bitwise uh, product, 1, 0, 0, 0, add these up modulo 2, that's 0. So that's what I mean by this notation. So this is something um, quite similar to a Fourier transform. You can see that your, your uh, new amplitudes are linear combinations of the old amplitudes. Uh, the coefficients all have the same magnitude, but just different phases on there, minus ones and plus ones. And in fact, you can think of this as being a Fourier transform, a discrete Fourier transform in the limit where uh, instead of modulo n, everything is modulo 2, and you're doing it separately on a bunch of, in, in an n-dimensional space. So that's the Hadamard transform. So some examples of what happens if we take the Hadamard transform of the L0 state, this is something we've seen already, we get the uniform superposition. Uh, so we already knew that applying a Hadamard uh, gate to the zero state gives you zero plus one, and the product of all those gives you the superposition over all bit strings uniformly. But now we can see this as a special case of this formula. This means we plug in x is the all zero string here, so all these phases are plus one. And if we take the Hadamard transform of a state of this form, minus 1 to the k dot x, ket x, we get that k. And so uh, if you compare this to the formula on the previous slide, you can see the Hadamard transform is self-inverse. It takes these states with different k to these computational basis states and back. So uh, now, there is, you can use this already to do a generalization of Deutsch's algorithm, which is called the deutsch josa algorithm. And it's quite similar. So now you have an oracle which takes n bits of input and produces one bit of output. And what you're promised is that f is either balanced or constant. So that means either it always outputs 1, it always outputs 0, or it does half and half. But you don't know how these half and half are going to be distributed. It could be any way you want. So the pre-image of 1, these are going to be 2 to the n, 0, or a half of 2 to the n. So if you wanted to do this uh, classically, and you wanted to be certain about getting the right answer, you'd have to look at half of 2 to the n plus 1 of these different values, because you could just be getting very unlucky. So even if it's unbalanced, you could just be happening to land on the ones every time until you've checked more than half of them. Of course, if you're willing to do probabilistic algorithms, then actually, after only a very small number of random queries, you'll be quite confident about which of these things is the case. So the deutsch jose algorithm is not really quite a very satisfactory speed up against uh, a natural competitor, which would be probabilistic algorithms. But nevertheless, it's kind of an illustrative example. So how do we do uh, the deutsch josa algorithm? So we prepare the state, which is the uniform superposition over inputs with phases of minus 1 to the f of x, where f is this function that we're querying. So this is something we already know how to do. It's just our usual phase kickback trick. We use Hadamard gates to make the uniform superposition over inputs. We can use a Hadamard gate acting on the one state to make our special minus 1 phase kickback state. This is what I was calling phi of m yesterday in the special case that m equals 2. We apply our 
uh, oracle f. So it takes this input x, adds f of x modulo 2 down here. That kicks back a phase of minus 1 to the f of x. And then this uh, uh, state at the bottom we can throw away at the end. It's not entangled with what we have on top. So once we have this, once we've made this state, so henceforth in this talk I'll kind of just take as given. We understand how to make states of this form and we'll just use that uh, as a tool. So now we had a MARD transform this state. So <coughs> as we I showed a few slides ago, um, the Hadamard transform is defined like this. And so the amplitude on the zero state is going to be just all these things are going to be plus one here. And so it'll just be the sum of all these amplitudes here. So if it's balanced, this sum will be zero. And if it's constant, this sum will be plus or minus one. Uh, and so that's what we get. And then when we measure, our probability of measuring the zero state will be 1 if it's a uh, uh, constant function. And it'll be 0 uh, if it's a balanced function. So that's how the deutsch josa algorithm works. So here is a, a kind of shorthand uh, description of the quantum circuit for the deutsch josa algorithm. We start with all zero state. We apply a Hadamard to create the uniform superposition. We kick back this phase of minus 1 to the f, where f is the function we're querying. We Hadamard transform again, and then we measure in the computational basis. And there's another interesting and perhaps more interesting problem, which you can also solve with exactly this same circuit. And this is uh, what I refer to as the bernstein vassarani problem, although I think there are actually two different problems that are often referred to this way. The other of them is a, a somewhat more uh, complicated generalization of this, which was used to prove an oracle separation from, uh, from classical computing. But I'll just cover the simple case. So now, suppose our function f of x is ev even a little bit more structured. Now, f of x simply is a, uh, one of these dot product functions like I drew on the board just now for some hidden bit string k. And this hidden bit string is what we want to find out by making queries to this oracle f. So classically, we would need n queries to do this. And uh, basically, one way to see that is because each time you query f, you're only, it's only outputting one bit. So you're only learning one bit of information with each query. You're trying to find an n bit hidden string. So you definitely need at least n queries classically. But now, what happens if we apply our, uh, the same circuit to this problem, uh, to, to a, an oracle that has this special structure? So when we kick back this phase, minus 1 to the f, this is exactly minus 1 to the x dot k. It's exactly one of these states that, is in the, that form the basis that the Hadamard transform takes us between that basis and the computational basis. So now when we Hadamard transform this state, we get the computational basis state k, and we measure and we just get the classical bit string k. That's the output of our algorithm, and that's what we wanted to find. We've now found that with one query versus n classically. So this is maybe using the same circuit to get a more, uh, a more convincing speed up versus classical uh, computation. Now one criticism you could raise of this uh, algorithm is that the problem looks a little bit artificial, maybe a little bit constructed specifically so that it allows um, quantum algorithms to win. But if you slightly modify the problem, you can get something that looks actually somewhat more natural, which is a problem of estimating gradients of continuous functions. So uh, here, um, our problem is we have some oracle which is evaluating a function from Rn to R. And of course, when we implement this on a, any kind of digital computer, whether classical or quantum, we'll need both the input and the output to be represented with some finite bits of precision. Um, that is a detail I'll sort of not delve into very much. It's just kind of a secondary technical point. 
And we're given the promise that this is a differentiable function, and we want to find the gradient at some particular point, for example, at 0. So classically, if we wanted to do this, and the only ability we had was to make black box queries to this function f, there's not really much we can do. The only thing we can really do is we can pick a set of points that are close to each other and compute each of the um, partial derivatives separately by displacing along each of the axes and making little queries and taking differences to estimate the uh, partial derivatives. So here, if this is uh, in n dimensions, we need to make n plus 1 uh, queries classically. So what we can do now is just slightly modify our uh, bernstein vazirani circuit and use a Fourier transform over Rn instead of over Z2 to the n. So now after we've kicked back the phase E to the IF using our usual phase kickback tricks on the uniform superposition, uh, if uh, F is locally linear, which for any sufficiently small region it is, then this is exactly one of these plane wave states that when we take a Fourier transform, we, um, we take that to uh, the computational, the corresponding computational basis state. Okay. So basically, here we have around some little region, F is going to be approximately linear to lowest order. And we can do this and get our answer. We get our gradient out. OK. So sometimes uh, you shouldn't criticize people too much for working on quantum algorithms for problems that look contrived, because they can sometimes lead to uh, useful, uh, potentially useful things. So yes? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's. But the Hadamard is a Fourier transform. Yeah, so the Hadamard is kind of a limiting case of the Fourier transform, and this is a slightly, slightly more general thing. OK, so one. Uh, little aside is that uh, um, one way I like to think about uh, this particular algorithm is through an optical analogy, which um, I have for a while thought that there might be more insight into quantum algorithms that one could get by thinking this way. Uh, maybe someone here will think of something. Um, so if you uh, shine um, light from infinitely distant point sources um, onto a lens and compare what is the what do the wave fronts look like across the front of the lens versus what do they look like at the focal plane, what you see is these two things are related by a Fourier transform. So if we have the source coming from up here, then the wave fronts are coming in diagonally and these ones are ahead in phase of the ones at the bottom and the phase difference is linear across the face of the, of the lens. And so this is exactly the e to the i a x kind of uh, superposition. In this case, a classical wave superposition instead of quantum superposition. And such a thing will be focused. We know that if we shine it from up here, it'll be focused down there. If we shine it from down here, it'll be focused up here. So these different values of a here correspond to different delta functions of illumination on the focal plane located at different points. And where this is located depends linearly on A. So this is precisely a Fourier transform, taking these kind of superpositions to delta functions where you have amplitude 1 on some point and amplitude 0 elsewhere, just like in the quantum case. Now a second uh, piece is a lens. Here you start with incoming light. This is just creating uh, a phase difference, which varies linearly uh, across this plane because the the uh, glass is linearly thicker at the bottom. So now if you put these pieces together, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between these optical components and the steps in this um, quantum algorithm. So you first make, you start with the state all zeros. You want to make the uniform superposition. 
I did that using Hadamard transform, but you could just as easily do a Fourier transform, which also creates the uniform superposition when uh, applied to the L0 state. So that's like starting with a point source and applying a lens. This gives you uniform illumination. Here we kick back this linearly varying phase. That's like having a prism here. We do a second Fourier transform, which is our second lens. And now the location of this point is going to tell us what the slope of this prism is and correspondingly what the slope of this f is. Now, in the quantum case, you can do this in an arbitrary number of dimensions, which is why you get a more interesting speed up than just the optics where you're stuck to a fixed number of dimensions, order one. <coughs> so I've been using the quantum uh, Fourier transform over and over again yesterday and today for a lot of different things. So we used it to switch between the momentum basis and the position basis for simulating chemistry problems. We used it to prepare initial states, the phi m state and the uniform superposition state. We used it for phase estimation to measure in the eigenbasis of operators. We used it in this gradient estimation algorithm. It's already proven itself to be a very useful tool and we have not even yet used it for its most famous application, which is in Shor's algorithm. So now let me finally get to the point of showing you how the quantum Fourier transform actually works on a gate-by-gate -gate level. It's really not too complicated. So here's the, the uh, quantum Fourier transform. We start with some state psi, which is a superposition over the states j with corresponding amplitudes a of j. So that's just some arbitrary state. And when we do the Fourier transform, we get a new superposition whose coefficients are given by the Fourier transform of this function, A. So A tilde is related to A by this discrete Fourier transform given by this formula. So uh, it's not quite obvious, but this is indeed a unitary transformation. So that's the definition of the Fourier transform. So we can write it uh, in terms of uh, Dirac notation that, the Fourier, that a basis state will Fourier transform to one of these plane wave states like this. And if we know what it does to every basis state, we know everything about the, uh, about the unitary. Uh, you know, it's just like we're writing it as a matrix. We just write down the columns. That's all we need to know. So if you take this uh, formula and expand it in bit by bit, so now we think of this number j, let's say this capital N is 2 to the n, just for convenience then this j and this k are each written with n bits, just by usual binary place value. So the, the digits here are j1 through jn. The digits here are k1 through kn. And you can see that this formula, when you write it in bits, has a nice decomposition. And the point is, let's say the uh, most significant bit of k is a 1. So that means <coughs> you're going to have this two, uh, 2 to the n minus 1 multiplying this j. So you take these digits of j and you're shifting them left. And everything that ends up to the left of the uh, decimal point is irrelevant because that's just going to give you multiples of 2 pi in your phase. So the first, the most significant digit of k, what it does is it means we need to have a phase of e to the i 2 pi uh, 0 point, the last digit of j, if this most significant digit of k is a 1 and no corresponding phase otherwise. Now look at the next digit of k. Now we're multiplying uh, by 2 to the n minus 2. So we shift left all these digits of j up here by one less place. So now if that was a 0, we have nothing. And if that was a 1, we have to uh, include in our phase uh, 0 point, the last two digits of j. And if we do this bit by bit, we can see that this is our formula that's exactly equivalent to this one uh, written in bits. Uh, so are there any questions about that? This is sort of the, the essence of, of why it turns out to be efficient to do a quantum Fourier transform. OK, so now, given this formula, we can almost just read off what our circuit needs to be. 
So let's look at this. Uh, so we're sort of reading it in reverse order. So this piece, oops, this piece right here corresponds to this piece of the circuit. So this first digit of j, 0 to the i2 pi 0 point something is either going to be plus 1 or minus 1, because this is a half. So that corresponds to just doing this Hadamard gate right here on the first bit of j. On the second bit of j, we need a phase, which is either e to the i uh, um, pi over 2 or e to the, uh, or, or, or no phase, depending on that digit. So now what we can do is we can just do a conditional uh, phase gate to implement that piece. And we need one conditional phase gate for each of these digits. We do them one by one. And we do the such similar thing for each of these factors. So now the next one, we don't need to do n of these gates. We need to do n minus one of these gates, and n minus two of these gates. And the last one, we only need one gate, which is a Hadamard. So the total number of gates you can see is like n plus n minus one plus n minus two all the way down to one. So that's a quadratic number of gates. And that implements the Fourier transform defined by this formula. So that's really all there is to it. And I don't know if uh, pointing to formulas on a, a, a slide is a good way to expose it or not. But I'll just assert to you that if you didn't understand to it, you can just uh, look at my slides, which I put on the website, hopefully by now. I, th I think they're up. And if you stare at it for five minutes, you'll see how it works. <laughs> so, okay. So, one interesting thing you can, um, yes? Um, so, I, I just wanted to make sure that I understood. For the, for the, so, very little of this procedure is specific to the fact that it has to do specifically the quantum Fourier transform. Any sort of um, thing that you can decompose into a sum that's a unitary transformation, you could conceivably do in a way like this. Um, so there are a lot of generalizations of this. Um, the, the one that's maybe most widely studied is um, Fourier transforms over fu other finite groups. So you could think of this as being a special case where you're Fourier transforming uh, over an abelian group, in fact, just, just a cyclic group in this case. Um, and for lots of groups, it's also known how to do this. It's known for the symmetric group. Uh, um, and in that case, basically what they're taking advantage of is kind of a, a subgroup structure that the symmetric group on n items contains as a subgroup, the symmetric group on n minus 1 and n minus 2, and you have this chain of smaller subgroups. And the representations of the symmetric group can be written in such a way that it's adapted to this chain of subgroups. And that makes it feasible to implement efficiently by quantum circuits. So there's a paper by Beals about this and one by um, uh, um, uh, Chris Moore and Alex Russell. And you might find those to be interesting. But yeah, there are a lot of other generalizations of this. OK. So one comment to make about the quantum Fourier transform is you can't actually use it for doing Fourier transforms, which is important to keep in mind. In a, so the, the, the point is that classically, um, there's something known called the fast Fourier transform. And what do they mean by fast? What they mean by fast is we have a vector of n amplitudes that are just written down uh, you know, as floating point numbers on your computer or something. And you can transform that to obtain its Fourier transform, also written down as a list of floating point numbers in time which goes like n log n. And that's pretty fast. But what our quantum computer is doing is we're looking at 2 to the n amplitudes. And we're Fourier transforming those in order n squared quantum gates. So this is exponentially faster than what the fast classical uh, Fourier transform is doing. But the problem is you can't use this directly for uh, doing Fourier transforms because you don't have access to all these amplitudes. You can only do you know, physical measurements. So you learn something collectively about the state defined by this list of amplitudes, but there's no way you can extract this full exponentially long list uh, uh, of numbers in any polynomial amount of time. 
Nevertheless, although you can't use this directly for doing Fourier transforms, you can use it for a lot of useful things, some of which we've already seen and some of which I'll now show you. <clears throat> so one of the things is period finding. So in this case, we again have an oracle, which I again call f. And in this case, it takes uh, an input, which are integers modulo n. And its output could really just be anything. So we'll just say its output is some elements of some finite set s. So <clears throat> our promise on this uh, function is that it's periodic. So uh, what I mean is that f of x equals f of y if and only if m divides x minus y. Uh, and our goal is to find this period m. And so classically, in the general case, you need, uh, if m could range anywhere from 1 to n, you need order n queries because it could take you that long before you even see a, a recurrence of this function. But quantum mechanically, uh, you can do this much faster only uh, in a time scaling logarithmically um, in capital N. So we again get an exponential speed up. So the, the early simplest version of this algorithm runs in log cubed N, although there are more modern improvements shaving down this uh, uh, exponent. So what do we do? Well, we again uh, have a pretty simple algorithm. We start with the uniform superposition over inputs. Now we compute F into an auxiliary register. This time we're not computing f into the phase. We're just computing it right into a register of bits. And as soon as we do that, we measure that register of bits, and we Fourier transform the input register and measure. So now let's uh, work through uh, the circuit to see what happens. So one uh, minor technical point is I've shown you the Fourier transform uh, for uh, where n is a power of 2. If it's not a power of 2, that induces a little bit of more annoying work you have to do, which I'm not going to talk about. But there's not much to it. And you can find it in Nielsen and Schwann, uh, which is a book I recommend, by the way. OK. So what happens with this, with this circuit? So we start with the uniform superposition. We evaluate f. So now we have the superposition of x and then f of x in the second register. These registers are now entangled. There's no way of writing this as a product of some state on the first one and some state on the second one. Now we measure the second register. So what that's going to do is it collapses us onto some random value, which I'll call r. And what we're left with in the first uh, register is a superposition, a uniform superposition over the pre-image of r. So these are all the values of x such that f of x equals r. That's what we've projected down onto. We don't get to choose r, though. That's just determined randomly. And so if we think about what this is, recall that f is a periodic function. So the pre-image of any particular random value is going to start in some random place, and then you'll have a repetition of it after the period m, and then another 2m. So we have x0, naught, x0 naught plus m, x0 naught plus 2m, and so on. That's our superposition that we have right here, where this x0 naught is some random thing that we don't have control over. So now you'll notice that if we just did our measurement right away, we would still learn nothing, because all the structure about this periodicity is washed out by this random uh, uh, offset, which is different every time we run the algorithm. So sampling from a supply of these states just by direct measurement is still useless. So we need to do something that takes away this random offset so that it stops uh, you know, spoiling our fun. So is the, addition, um, is the addition, you're adding them as binary numbers, or you're adding them uh, parallel bit by bit? Uh, no, so here, zero, then. right. So here what we're doing is we're doing this addition modulo capital N, just as elements of Z mod N. So that's what this plus means in this case, okay. yeah. That's an important point. So that's actually a, kind of the, the difference between this and, say, bernstein vazirani type algorithms where we're doing bitwise uh, modulo 2 kind of yeah. addition. OK. And one thing that will get rid of this offset is a Fourier transform. If you take a function and you have an offset of that function, you Fourier transform those. Those will 
differ only by phases. The amplitudes of those two things will be the same. And then when we measure the probability distributions that we get will be independent of this offset x. So we Fourier transform that. And the way what happens is if you start with some superposition that looks like a lattice, you Fourier transform, what you'll get is a superposition over the dual lattice. So if you have something with spacing m, now you have something with spacing n over m. If we have an offset x naught, <coughs> that creates some phases on these different pieces of the superposition, which are uh, proportional to x naught. But if we're just, as our next step, doing a measurement, we don't care at all about those phases. What our measurement will tell us, it will just select randomly one of these multiples of n over m each time. So that's what we get. And so now we just need to do a little bit of post-processing. So we just run this algorithm a bunch of times. Each time we get a different random multiple of n over m. And by Euclid's algorithm, we know that we can compute the greatest common divisor of all these random uh, multiples of n over m that we get from the different in, uh, applications of this algorithm. And after uh, not too many samples, with high probability, the greatest common divisor of these different random multiples of uh, n over m is going to just be n over m itself. And then we're done. We found n over m. We can just take n divided by that, recover m, uh, and now we know the period of this function. So that's how the period finding algorithm works. It's basically an application of the Fourier transform. So not too surprising that Fourier transforms are good at finding periodicity of things. OK. Now, there are a number of uh, generalizations of this. One is you could just go to higher dimensions. So that's like the one dimensional case. You could have a higher dimensional periodic function where uh, f of x plus k for some vector k is equal to f of x. Uh, if and only if k is an element of some lattice, so integer linear combinations of some basis. You know, so uh, now our uh, superpositions, say in two dimensions, are just going to be things that you know look like some regular lattice like this, instead of looking like a one-dimensional set of spikes we had before. So again. Uh, our goal is uh, to find out what this periodicity is. In this case, that means finding a basis for this lattice. So we can do essentially the direct generalization of what we did in the last couple of slides. We create a superposition, uniform superposition over a preimage of some random value. That will be a superposition over a lattice. We Fourier transform that. That will give us a superposition over the dual lattice. We sample from that. And there exist known classical algorithms where if you can sample from elements of a lattice, after a short amount of time, you can figure out a basis for that lattice. And then given a basis for a dual lattice, you can efficiently compute a basis for the original lattice. So not much beyond what we just saw. So now we're going to build towards uh, Another application, which is period, uh, which is um, order finding of elements of a group. But as a prerequisite for that, we need to have an efficient algorithm for computing high powers of group elements. And it turns that out that you can do this very fast indeed um, in, a, in kind of a black box way. So suppose you have some group G. And the only thing you really know how to do on this group is multiply elements, pairs of elements. And you can do that, let's just call it unit time. So in that case, you can use that primitive to compute, given uh, an element of g, you can compute g to the p in time scaling only logarithmic in this power p. And how do you do that? It's another simple place value trick. So we can compute g to the 2 to the n by taking g times g. Now we know g squared. We take g squared times g squared. Now we have g to the fourth. We take that with itself. And so after n times, we have g to the 2 to the n. So now we have this little catalog of g to the 2 to the n for all the n's up to some value. And then we look at the binary expansion of p. So p is a sum of a bunch of powers of 2. 
And so we can correspondingly take these g to the powers of 2, multiply them together, corresponding to each bit in the binary expansion of p that's, that's a 1, then we get g to the p. So that's all you need to do to get exponentially high powers of, of a group element using only polynomial number of multiplications. So that's just a classical algorithm. So once you have that, you can combine it with our tool of uh, period finding to do order finding. So let me define the order finding problem. So you're given some element x, which could be an element of anything. It could be uh, an el any, anything that has a notion of multiplication, basically. So I'll, I'll say it's an element of a group. It could be the integers mod n. It could be the element of some matrix group. It basically doesn't matter. It just be, has to be something that you can raise to powers. So what we want to find is find the smallest integer k such that x to the k power is the identity. So this reduces right away to period finding. We define our oracle. f of y is x to the y power. And so just from this fact that x to the k equals the identity, we know that f of x plus k equals f of x. And that's the periodicity of this function. So because we have our efficient classical algorithm for raising to powers, including exponentially high powers, that means we can correspondingly have a polynomial size reversible circuit that does this. And we can use that as a subroutine, or as an oracle, if you will, in our period finding uh, problem. And so that exactly solves. Uh, oh. <laughs> Yes, sorry about that. Both of these x's should be y's. OK. So that's how uh, order finding works. Um, now there's a, a related thing. It's just uh, a little bit less obvious uh, that you can do, more or less using the same technique, which is computing discrete logarithms. And this is, uh, was one of the things that really got people's attention about quantum computing because discrete logarithms are a uh, problem that computer scientists really care about. In particular, it's a problem that cryptographers really care about since you break Diffie-Hellman if you can do this sufficiently. So you can reduce discrete logarithms to two-dimensional period finding. So I'll let you think for uh, a moment to see if you see how that goes. It's a little bit of a clever trick. So what you do is you have your function f that takes two inputs, a and b, and it outputs x to the a, y to the minus b. So what you can see is that if x to the k equals y, you increase, uh, uh, did I get this backwards? OK. So you increase, uh, no, that's right. So if you increase x a by k and you increase b by 1, then you end up with what you started with. So now you have this periodicity of this two-dimensional function. And you use just the straightforward uh, uh, generalization of period finding that I mentioned a few slides ago, finding lattices from dual lattices and all that. So you can reduce discrete logarithms to period finding. Now exercise number three is Shor's algorithm. Now, actually, this one is actually a bit more uh, non-trivial, but it's, it's not so bad. And in fact, I think it should be possible to understand it from, from in the form of one slide. So it turns out that factoring of integers uh, reduces to period finding, uh, order finding more specifically. This is actually already known before uh, Shor found his quantum algorithm. And Here's how it works. So first of all, there's a little um, uh, prerequisite fact. And maybe I'll just go through this first before describing the algorithm. So suppose you have some number, capital N. This is the thing that you're trying to factor. And you know that y to the r is congruent to 1 mod n. So that means that n divides y to the r minus 1. That's just a, basically a rewriting of this equation. Now, we, if r happens to be even, we can uh, factorize this uh, as, you know, this is a difference of two squares, so we can factorize it in the usual way. 
So n divides this product. <coughs> so if n divides a product like this, then uh, these things must contain uh, non-trivial factors of n. So imagine we, we could always take these two numbers to be reduced modulo n, since that's the, the um, setting in which we're working. So n divides this product. It means that all the prime factors of n have to be found on this side. We can just, some of them might be in this bucket, some of them might be in this bucket. Uh, the only way you could fail to have uh, one of these have a GCD with n, which is a non-trivial factor, is if all the prime factors of n are in just one of these buckets, and none of them in the other one. And that, yes? Why, why has R to be even? Oh, <laughs> yes. So we're just taking it as assumption. Suppose R is even, yeah. So the only way we could fail to find a non-trivial factor of n by taking the GCD of uh, the, these things with n is if all those prime factors are all in the same bucket and none of them are in the other one. So this one will be co-prime to n and this one, the factor in common will n will be n itself. But that's impossible because these things are taken modulo n, so they're, they're smaller than n. They're at most n minus 1. So we will find a non-trivial factor of n if we can find a solution like this in the case that r is even. And if you look at this, this is basically period finding. We want to find what the period of y is in the group z mod n. So that tells us how to do Schwarz algorithm. We choose some random y co-prime to n. We find the order r of y in z mod n. We check whether that order is even. If it's not, we go back, we choose a different random y. And in fact, r will be even like half the time or something, so this is not a, a big deal. So you can prove that this happens uh, frequently, just as you might guess. And so if it is even, you just compute these GCDs. That will give you a, a non-trivial factor of n. So you peel off that factor. You go back, and you do it again until you've peeled off every prime factor of n, and now you have a complete prime factorization of this number, capital N. So once you have order finding as a, as a tool, you can actually write down Shor's algorithm uh, in one slide. And the only thing I've really left out is the proof that R is uh, even with, um, with pretty high probability if you choose Y at random, but that's not too surprising and it's also pretty easy to prove. Okay, so let me summarize the things I've looked at so far before moving on to uh, some generalizations. So let's see. Uh, yes. So uh, yeah, I should say that. This, uh, that was a, uh, a thing I should be more explicit about. So basically, this is going to be an algorithm that runs basically in log capital N cubed time. Uh, and Let's see, I'm not sure if I could uh, go through the accounting for that right off the top of my head. But basically, uh, yes, certainly if you break down the circuit and gate count, that actually ends up using mo more of the gates than any other piece, more even than the Fourier transforms, which is kind of an interesting fact. It's kind of the classical piece that uh, occupies most of your resources, but yes, it's it's very funny thing. So yeah, anyway, the the direct answer to your question is this is running in uh, log capital N cube time. Uh, yes, the the probability of that is non-zero, but it becomes exponentially small, yeah. So it is a probabilistic algorithm, uh, even aside from quantum things being almost always probabilistic. Okay, so <coughs> we've seen oracles and recursion and the dangers of recursion, the powers of recursion. Actually, I mostly focused on dangers rather than powers, but there's actually now 
a body of work that's been rapidly developing uh, about thinking about query algorithms in a, in a nicely composable recursive way. Uh, and this is uh, using something called span programs, which have been developed by uh, Ben Reichardt and Robert Spalek. And that was one of the really strong candidates of things to present in my lectures. I think it's one of the, the important topics now, but I didn't end up including it. So if you're interested in reading more stuff, that's one of the things I would especially recommend. OK, we've done the Hadamard test, which will be a star player in the third lecture for estimating uh, topological invariance. We did the Hadamard transform and Fourier transform. <coughs> Fourier transform is really just a generalization, or you could say the Hadamard transform is a special case. And we used these to do some of the classic quantum algorithms. So now let's look at a somewhat more general point of view on what we've been doing. We've seen examples. Let's try to zoom out and gather general principles of, of what's been going on. So one way that people think about these things is something called the hidden subgroup problem. And here you think of G as being some finite group, S as being some finite set, and H being a subgroup of G. And you're given an oracle, which takes as its input elements of this group G and produces as its output elements of this arbitrary set S. So these are just labels, really, the elements of S. And uh, what we have as a promise uh, is that F is constant and distinct on left cosets of H. So we could also do the same, define the problem with right cosets. Instead, it's the same computational difficulty. So just to pick a convention, people say, oh, let's just always talk about left cosets. So what that means is f of x and f of y are equal if and only if there exists some element h in the subgroup capital H such that x equals y times h. And our goal is to find a set of elements which generate h. So the interesting case of this is where uh, capital G is exponentially large. Capital H may all often also be exponentially large. So we're not going to just write down all the elements of H. We can just find a generating set. And you'll know that for any finite group, there's always going to exist a set of generating elements, which is only logarithmic in, this, in the no total number of elements of the group. So that sounds a little abstract, but you can see that uh, a number of the things we've just done are precisely special cases of this problem. So imagine the special case that this group is the integers modulo z under addition. Uh, then <coughs> we could, the subgroups are all of this form. They're the set of multiples of some element of, uh, of g, uh, taken modulo m, and this is some m, uh, taken modulo n, and this is going to be some m that always divides n. So those are all the subgroups of g. So in this case, the cosets, the left cosets and the right cosets are the same thing since everything commutes. It's just addition. The cosets <coughs> are all the, period, all the periodic functions with period m. Because if you take this, you have h itself, and then you can add 1. That gives you to each of these. That's an offset. That's one of the cosets. You offset it one more. That's another coset. Those are all the cosets of this. So. Our goal is to find a generating set for this subgroup H. Well, there's only one choice. There's this element M itself that generates this subgroup. We just keep adding M. That makes all of H. So now this is period finding. We have some function which is periodic with period M, and we want to find M. So we, we just did that a few slides ago. That's one special case. Uh, and for abelian groups, we know how to solve this problem on a quantum computer. So if all the elements commute, we know how to do this. And basic, the basic idea is very easy to state. All it is is that an abelian group is always um, isomorphic to uh, a product of cyclic groups. So basically, all this is is the whole problem of finding periodicities in higher dimensions. You're just looking for these lattices 
uh, some kind of uh, lattices in higher dimensional space. It's nothing more than that. So I, the, several slides ago, I asserted in a somewhat skipping of details way that you, you can find these higher dimensional periodicities using straightforward Fourier transforms. And one reason that people were very interested in hidden subgroup problems was that if you could solve the hidden subgroup problem for the symmetric group, this would solve a very important uh, computer science problem, which Scott mentioned this morning, called graph isomorphism. And even though we know how to do the Fourier transform efficiently by a quantum circuit over the symmetric group, it turns out that that by itself does not give us an efficient quantum algorithm for solving the symmetric group uh, uh, hidden subgroup problem, and it does not give us an efficient algorithm for quantum algorithm for graph isomorphism. And indeed, we don't know how to solve this. People have tried a long time. And in fact, now people start to write papers saying, well, let's assume that you can't do this. Does that allow us to prove that some crypto systems are secure and things like that? So uh, I give those guys credit for making uh, lemonade out of their lemons. <coughs> So the dihedral uh, hidden subgroup problem is another um, pretty important special case of this. Uh, and it turns out that this is closely related to lattice problems. For example, let's say you have some lattice and you're just told some uh, point in space and you want to say, what's the nearest lattice point to that, that thing? Well, of course, in two dimensions, this is very easy. We can do it just with our eyes. But in n dimensions, uh, this is hard, especially if the basis you're told for the lattice is a kind of perversely chosen basis. It's not the really natural one, like, say, you know, this kind of thing, but some weird ba skewed basis like this, which generates everything, but only using big coefficients to get back down to the small vectors. So that's an example of a hard lattice problem. Another one is find the shortest non-zero vector in a lattice. And these things are very closely related to dihedral hidden subgroup. And there has been some progress on this problem. The best algorithm is uh, uh, what's called Cooperberg sieve, uh, discovered by Greg Cooperberg, which solves this problem in sub-exponential time. So the dihedral group is the symmetries of the n-sided polygon. This is just the reflections and rotations. And it has two n elements. And his algorithm runs in time 2 to the order square root of n. So this is not that fast, but it, it's, uh, it's faster than uh, classical algorithms. Uh, it's definitely a much more modest speed up than what we get for abelian hidden subgroup. And it turns out, unfortunately, it's not good enough to give you uh, direct uh, application to these lattice problems that people really care about, at least as far as anyone can tell. When you run the reduction from the lattice problem to dihedral hidden subgroup, the overhead of that reduction is enough to undo the speed up that you get from Cooperberg's sieve. But this is nevertheless an interesting class of algorithms which actually looks somewhat different from the things that we have seen. Um, OK, so the basic point is that uh, the, the, it's not too obvious. So this is a good question. Um, the, the, uh, it turns out the dihedral hidden subgroup problem, you can reduce it to the case where the hidden subgroup is just an order two subgroup. So it's just the identity element and a reflection. Um, so when you do this usual trick, uh, of creating the uh, what I might what you might call the pre-image state. Let me see if I write that down somewhere here. Uh, I know I do. Yes, you create a state like this. This is going to be a superposition of just two things, and basically what you want to know in in some senses how far apart those two things are that you're getting a superposition of. Just measuring will project you onto just one of those things, so you don't learn anything. And in fact, these things, again, are always given, have random displacements on them. In the dihedral, uh, so that's what happened to the dihedral hidden subgroup problem. 
in the, in the lattice problem, let's suppose you want to find the shortest non-zero vector of a lattice, and you're given the promise that the shortest non-zero vector is quite a lot smaller than the second shortest. What you can do in that case is you can just divide space into like hypercubes. You just do a measurement like which hypercube am I sitting in? And so what, you'll, what happens, you'll get some random outcome that'll project you down only the uh, lattice points that are inside that hypercube will be left and everything else gets projected away. Now you have, and, and so if you have this promise that the second shortest thing is a lot longer, these lattice points are gonna mostly come in these little pairs so it's quite likely that you'll get a single pair. Uh, you won't get two pairs, and you won't get something spanning the edge. So now you're again making, you have this sort of little factory that you can do this measurement. You can make these superpositions of two points that are close to each other, and you want to find out how close they are. So then you're left with the same problem. So it's not exactly a, a classical reduction of one problem to the other, but kind of the natural approaches that you would take for both of these things lead you to the same uh, quantum processing problem at the end. So this has been studied very extensively by Oded Regev, and, and he's, he's had a lot of, uh, um, he, he's developed a pretty under, a deep understanding of, of this, the relationship between lattice problems and uh, um, Yes, that is not too obvious. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, if you take that approach, um, uh, so these problems be become hard classically in high dimensions. That problem of determining the distance between pairs of points quantum mechanically already seems to be hard uh, in one dimension. So sometimes, you, in some way, you've taken a step in the wrong direction by reducing things in this way. Uh, but there was hope that by clever quantum tricks, you might win anyway. It's known that with only um, a, lot, a, a modest number of copies of that state, you have enough information to solve the problem. So that was encouraging. But no one has been able to devise the appropriate measurement to do on that state to efficiently extract the relevant information. <coughs> okay. All right. So this is a very tempting problem to work on because we know how to do it for abelian groups and two of the non-abelian special cases are very well motivated. But we don't have very fast algorithms for those. A very closely related problem is hidden shift. So now we have two oracles. And let's say they're just on, again, z mod n mapping to some set of labels s. And we're given the problem that this oracle is the same as the other one, except it evaluates a shift of that same function. And we want to find out what that shift is. So this sounds quite similar to periodicity finding. In periodicity finding, it would be the case that you know, g of x equals g of x plus s. But now, it's just slightly different. And it turns out that this seemingly small difference actually makes a big difference computationally. So it turns out, in fact, uh, I, sorry, this should say hidden subgroup, that hidden shift uh, on a group g uh, reduces to hidden subgroup problem on the wreath product of G with Z2. Now, that's a funny kind of group product. What it means is that in this case, Z mod N, which is kind of the simplest case, um, it exactly reduces to the dihedral hidden subgroup problem. And you can actually kind of see why that is. If you had these two oracles, you could build a slightly bigger oracle by calling these as subroutines. This takes in two inputs. One is a bit, and one is this element b of z mod n. And you output either f of x if b equals 0, or g of x if b equals 1. And so basically, this has a periodicity where you move b to uh, 
you know, b plus s, and you shift x from 0 to 1. And so this is a, a periodicity in the dihedral, of a dihedral type. OK. And so by this reduction and using Cooperberg's sieb, sieve algorithm, we know that we can solve uh, hidden shift problems for arbitrary injective functions in 2 to the order, sorry, this should be 2 to the order square root n time, not log n. Uh, and well, that's a sub-exponential time algorithm. But actually, for certain special functions, it turns out that one can do uh, a lot better than this. And I guess I'll just uh, uh, give a couple of um, examples So in the, in the next uh, few minutes to finish up. So the particular uh, cases that we'll look at, which in fact, we can get very fast algorithms are uh, Legendre symbols. This was shown originally uh, by Van Dam and subsequently with generalized with uh, collaborators uh, Sean Hallgren and Lawrence Ipp. And um, uh, we can also do this interestingly uh, with random Boolean functions, which is quite a recent result by Gavinsky, Rotler, and Roland. So this is maybe the most recent algorithm that I'll show you in, in this set of slides. And that's actually from maybe um, a, not two years ago or something. So there's, there's still a lot happening. It's not, it's not all the algorithms are old algorithms. So the way to understand these cases of hidden shift where we can really do things very efficiently is to think about the Fourier convolution theorem, which you might be familiar with. And so first, let's set definitions. So the convolution of functions f and g is defined like this. So you take all the shifts of g, and you take linear combinations of those according to, to f. And then, we use, then we'll use a little star to denote that. So that's a very physical operation. You know, we see convolutions uh, you know, in optics, you know, if you you have a sharp image, you convolve it with a Gaussian that gives you a blurry image. It's exactly this kind of thing. And here, f dot g I'll use to represent just the pointwise product of f and g. This is just f of x times g of x. And then I'll use this curly f to represent the Fourier transform of a function. So pointwise product and convolution are dual to each other by Fourier transforms. The Fourier transform of a pointwise product is the convolution of the Fourier transforms, and the Fourier transform of a convolution is the point rise product of the Fourier transforms. And this is, you can already kind of see perhaps why this is a handy fact when we're talking about hidden shift problems, because the shift of a function is just a convolution of that function with a delta function that's placed somewhere other than zero, and that tells you how much the shift is. So what we can do is we sum over, we create a superposition over our shifted function f. And this shifted function of f is the convolution of f with a delta function located at our shift s. Then we Fourier transform. So we know by the convolution theorem that the result will be the point rise product of the Fourier transform of f, which I just call f tilde and the Fourier transform of a delta function, which is just a plane wave. So now we have the magical step. This is the step where we need to take advantage of the special structure of f. That, well, maybe f is some very special structured thing, like a Legendre function, or a not so special thing, like a random Boolean function, it turns out has uh, the right properties to allow us to do hidden shift uh, efficiently. But let's stick to the Legendre function case. Uh, if we can compute f tilde of x and we can divide by it somehow, then what we're left with is this plane wave state where s is the wave vector. So we Fourier transform, we get s. So, but there's, of course, a very funny thing here. How do we divide by f tilde of x? Is that even unitary? Can you even compute f tilde of x? That's, that's the tricky part. Well, 
the other steps are not tricky. So creating the uniform superposition, we've done that 100 times in this lecture. I won't belabor the point. Uh, uh, creating this, so that's no problem. The last Fourier transform, we've seen the circuit now. We know how to do that. This dividing step is the hard part. Now, one thing you can see is if f tilde is just a phase, e to the i some, some function of x, then at least dividing by it is a unitary transformation. We're just shifting the phases. And if we can also uh, compute that efficiently, we can do this division by phase kickback. We just compute f tilde and kick back the phase e to the minus i f tilde of x. So it, here's the Legendre symbol function. Uh, chi of x equals 0 if x is 0, plus 1 if x, if there exists a y squared uh, such that x equals y squared mod p and minus 1 otherwise. So this is something you can compute. And it turns out that the Fourier transform of chi other than a funny little phase factor and whatever, is basically the same as chi itself. So you can see that this, except for the zero state, which is, you know, it's just one state of two to the n. You can, you, you can wave your hands and, and smooth over that little problem. Um, this is exactly the right kind of function we want. It's a phase, and we can compute it. So this is exactly the right sort of thing to use in the deconvolution uh, algorithm for hidden shift that I described on the previous slide. So somehow, uh, it's kind of amazing that you know someone would have broad enough knowledge to be thinking about hidden shift and suddenly say, oh, aha, I know. We'll use the, the Legendre symbol. That has all the right properties to be suited for this problem. But I guess uh, Wim van Dam had such knowledge and, and pointed that out in a paper. And here's the most recent, more generalized version of this. Okay, and it turns out another interesting case, if you have a random Boolean function, that's a function from z2 to the n to z2. So taking bit strings as input, producing a single bit as output. If you pick, a, it's not true that you can always solve hidden shift for this uh, in the worst case, but if you choose such a function at random, then with high probability, that induces a hidden shift problem that you can efficiently solve on a quantum computer. And this basically is also relying on the fact that the Fourier transform of a random Boolean function is almost just phases. It's a very flat Fourier transform, and so you can basically divide by it uh, unitarily. The algorithm is a little bit different from what I showed, but it's the essential factor relying on is the flatness of the Fourier transforms. This is a very recent paper uh, by Gavinsky, Rocheler, and Rowland. And so that's how I'll finish. Just you can see there's some new things happening. And next time I'll talk about some relatively, not as new, but relatively new things using, uh, instead of a Fourier transform as our tool, we're going to use gate universality and Hadamard transforms <laughs> to do topological invariance.